Welcome to the We Are Libertarians presidential candidate series. I am your host, Hody Johns. I am joined by the first of our presidential can candidates, Daniel Berman. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. How about you? Doing great, doing great. For those of you who might be listening on Spotify or iTunes, that's great. But if you want to take a look at our website, we'relibertarians.com or YouTube, we actually have a video and he's looking spectacular. Uh, if, you, if you don't know Daniel Berman, he is the guy with the yellow hat. And it is in full glory, even on this episode, uh, <laughs> with your middle name plastered right on it. it says taxation is theft, from what I understand. That's right. <laughs> yes, my middle name is Taxation is Theft. So, uh, fun fact, Daniel has recorded uh, this episode. This will be a second time now because the guy who operates our equipment, me, uh, messed up. So, he was nice enough to grant us a second interview in which he will, he will answer these same questions. <laughs> and so, I appreciate your patience, Daniel. I... Uh, you, Absolutely. Like, like I said, like I said last time, I I've had plenty of career time in video production, so uh -huh. I know the struggle, and I've made the same mistake <laughs> myself. So, no worries. Awesome. Well, speaking of the video production, question number one: Let's just talk about who you are as a person outside of politics. Give me all your personal details. Just we're going to ask a million other questions about politics, but but let's hear about who you are, what the family, friends situation, job situation, just. All, all of that. Sure. So I grew up in Los Angeles, right next to LAX. Um, my my grandfather used to tell me all the stories about how it used to be bean fields as far as the eye could see. Um, <laughs> and now there's an airport there, which is ever expanding. And, and so I grew up with airplanes pretty much flying over my house. Um, but uh, I became, uh, my dad was, a, was an engineer of sorts. Um, he worked for some aerospace uh, companies and we got our first computer in the mid 80s, I guess, and I kind of took that opportunity to turn myself into a computer nerd, began <laughs> um, programming, later started playing around with graphics and video. Um, I turned into kind of a, a, a movie special effects nerd, and, and for a while I was, I was really into you know, creating special effects, compositing, all that sort of stuff. Um, and I, um, I had never found any education um, around that stuff in school. Although I did, I did take, I guess I did take a little bit in, uh, uh, I got, uh, in my final year of years of high school, I got into uh, a couple classes at the community college, which was actually trying to get a lot of people into a special effects house. Um, there were a lot of those starting to pop up around Santa Monica. So, um, I got into one of one or two of those classes and, uh, it's funny because I had done so much on my own that I actually ended up teaching one of the classes on animation because I kind of already knew everything and the teacher, one of the professors was a little bit uh, behind on some of that stuff. So that was kind of cool. But after that, I just kind of, um, I, I kind of drifted away from the college experience because I was like, I want to do some, I, I want to start, I want to get to work. So I started looking for work. Um, I got some work as, as a web developer, as a video editor, sometimes as both. Um, and I've had a pretty successful career with that. And I've kind of, for a while, flip-flopped between video production and, and software engineering. So that's where I am now. I'm a software engineer um, working for a company out of New York, uh, living most of the time in Mexico, and um, doing pretty good. Oh, <clears throat> living most of your time in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's, um, that's a question. I don't know if you want me to answer that now or, or later, but it's, it's something that's been brought up. Um, by, you know, a couple of people, if that's gonna, if that's gonna be a question for my eligibility, um, or anything like that, I'm technically here on just a really long vacation. Um, so I go back and forth to the U S all the time and, uh, and it, it doesn't disqualify me at all, but you know, there, there have been a couple of people that question it. Well, how are you going to run a country when you don't even live there? Um, obviously I'd move back. <laughs> Awesome. Sorry, we just got some uh, plumbing going on around the house here, so right. I'm a little loud on my end. No um, so give me your liberty journey. I think everybody's got a unique story. Use, yours is also right there. I found it fascinating last time, so let's hear it again. <laughs> All right, I'll see if I can nail it the same way I did last time. <laughs> um, so I grew up in Los Angeles. Um, it's kind of a socialist uh, place of sorts. Everyone's pretty much a Democrat. 
Um, it was uh, very anti-gun. I remember I did a school project one time and, and one of the kids, we were doing a video project. Um, and one of, one of the kids that was on the team brought over a BB gun to my house. And I was like, oh my God, do I need to call the police? Cause this was like, this was like the <laughs> propaganda that like dare programs and everything had put into me. Like you're not allowed to play with guns. And like, I, even after I found out it was just a BB gun, I was like weirdly paranoid. Um, anyway, fast forward. Um, I, I grew up a little bit. I ended up voting for Obama cause I was like, yeah, this system sucks and he's going to change it. He's giving us hope and change. And then I was like, Oh, that was a lie. Um, and unfortunately it was right after that, that I discovered Ron Paul. Um, and from there kind of became a Republican. That's right around the time I moved to Texas and started really having fun with guns and, and uh, not, not being afraid of them anymore. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so, um, so yeah. And then, uh, from there I saw what the Republicans did to Ron Paul and I was like, okay, well the Republicans suck. And also there was a little bit of the tea party thing because I was kind of joining the tax protest at that time. So I was like, okay, tea party, it's against the taxes. And then that got hijacked by like the Republican party and it turned into that whole shenanigan. So, um, so that's all out the window. Um, next thing you know, I'm still supporting Ron Paul. And then I'm like, Oh, libertarians, that sounds interesting. So that's kind of where I found the libertarians. Um, I'll say I found them. They didn't find me because it's, uh, you know, it's the struggle. How do you find new people to join the party? Sure. Um, so, and, and I think I did talk about, um, I, I had a history, even going back to California where, you know, as a teenager, I started getting traffic tickets and learning how to fight them. And from there, I kind of, you know, I was looking for more advanced ways to fight it. What are other people doing? And I kind of discovered the sovereign citizens. And I was like, this sounds fishy. This, this sounds like um, a conspiracy theory. And so I was, you know, in video production, I was like, I want to make a documentary about this. I want to figure out what's real, what's not. And as I started figuring out what was real and what wasn't, I actually started getting really depressed because I was like, holy shit. A lot of the stuff they're saying is, is batshit crazy, but a lot of it is true. The courts are fake. There's, uh, there's, you know, there's all these assumptions made about you when you go into a court and if you don't object to them, they'll be assumed as fact and your, your rights will just be walked right over and you're screwed. Um, so, so I did a lot of investigation into that and, and, um, yeah. And so that, that ended up with me, uh, not having a driver's license or registering my cars for the past 10 years and, uh, and doing pretty good with that. So. <laughs> so a great presidential candidate, terrible driver is what I'm hearing. So uh, yeah, I, I wasn't really a terrible driver. I mean, I got like speeding tickets, you know, um, there was, oh, this, this was a fun story we talked about last night is, you know, running red lights when it's actually safe and the cops are always hiding in the bushes to give you a ticket. And, you know, everyone will say, well, even though it's safe, just wait for the thing to turn green. Well, there was, there was this red light that I grew up around that in the middle of the night, um, for some, I think it was supposed to be on a sensor and the sensor just didn't work. So for some reason, whenever I took this exit off the freeway in the middle of the night, I'd, I'd get to the red light and I'd sit there and I tested it before also. Like I, I ran it most of the time, but I actually sat and tested it and I sat there for over a half an hour and it never turned green. So I was like, it's either I'm going to sit here until, you know, tomorrow morning when, <laughs> when they switch to the other schedule, or I'm going to have to break the law and risk getting a, you know, a $300, $400 ticket. Yeah, starve to um, death in my car or get it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, the, the, I, I've had, uh, I think everybody said that experience with like a sensor not working. You look around, you're like, do I break the law and get a ticket maybe? Or what should I do here? Yeah. Uh, 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 and so you've, you kind of came, your journey is about exploring that type of thing and understanding how much, I guess, the law is stacked against you, but how much of it's not even accurate not even done correctly yeah how much fraud it's, there is within the system yeah it's really just it's it's intimidation it's false threats and and people just fall for it and and it's really unfortunate um but you know if 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 you don't assert your rights then you're going to do whatever they tell you to do and that includes handing them over all your money and yeah why are we doing that yeah so let's uh let's talk about <clears throat> the big three your the three biggest issues that you see face in America, we'll just handle them one by one. And we'll talk about what a Daniel Berman presidency would do to alleviate those issues. So what's problem number one, biggest issue face in America? 
So the biggest one is taxation. Everyone is complaining about, you know, we don't have enough money. We don't have enough jobs. We need minimum wage increases. We need all this stuff. Taxes are really the, the biggest part of that. We look at taxes and we think, you know, oh, 30% is coming out of our paycheck, um, less, maybe 10 or 20%, depending on how much you make. But the reality is there are so many more taxes that, you know, that, that come out of, um, you know, they're hidden in gas tax. Does anyone know how much they're paying in gas tax when they, when they go to the pump and fill up? Um, there's, there's sales tax. And even though they don't tax your groceries, you buy groceries and there are other taxes built in business licenses, FDA approvals, um, all these other things. So, so it's, it's insane. You talk about, um, your rent, even if you're paying property tax, even if you're just renting, probably a quarter to a third, sometimes more is going to property tax. Um, you know, people complain about, oh, on minimum wage, you can't afford a one bedroom apartment. Well, yeah, because you're, you automatically have like a 30 to 50% increase on your, um, on your rent, of course. Um, and then, and then on top of it, you've got, you know, 10 or 20 or 30% coming out of your paycheck to begin with, there's half your money gone. And now you got to spend it all on rent. Of course you can't afford it. So, so tax is, is one of the big ones. Um, the uh, national debt, is another big one of course that's that's uh the debt and taxation kind of go hand in hand the more the more debt there is um the the more they can take in taxes the more they can take in taxes the more the banks will say oh that's cash flow on your on your balance sheet we'll give you more money um so they they kind of they're always increasing together and of course that's all inflation which is the invisible tax um and then Finally, I would say the loss of freedom. Uh, the government, it's continuing to grow. Everybody says, you know, oh, that person shouldn't be able to do that. And as soon as one person says it, someone else says, well, if they can ban that. I want to ban this. And next thing you know, everyone's banning everybody else and, and we lose all our freedoms. That's a great top three. Uh, let's start at the top. Taxation, how do, you, how do you fix it, solve it, get rid of it, reform it? What do you do? Right. So the very first thing I want to do is I want to cut the income tax. Um, and, you know, even if we even if we uh, enforce it legally, most people who are earning wages are not going to pay that income tax. There's a lot of illegal practices that the IRS does to collect income tax from people who don't even really need to pay it. Yeah. Um, so the income tax is going to be the first one to go. A lot of people are going to have money back in their pocket and we're going to our economy is going to start booming again because um, taxes are kind of like, you know, if the economy is a spinning bicycle wheel, taxes are like friction that slow it down. Get rid of the friction. The wheels are going to spin. Economy is going to, going to start growing again. Um, uh, so, you know, that's, that's one of the first taxes. The next thing, you know, um, with taxes is everybody always asks, well, without taxes, how are you going to pay for the roads or police or courts and all these other things? Um, and, this is this is actually a really good question that people should be asking because the, the reason we are where we are is because nobody asked it before. Um, how do we pay for these things without taxes? It's a good question. We need to yeah. figure that out. Everything is different. The courts are different. The police are different. The roads are different. Um, even with roads, you can look at roads and there's a hundred different types of roads that are all going to be paid for differently. Um, and they can be paid for without taxes in a voluntary system. We just need to figure out exactly what that is and start exploring those options. I, I'm I'm glad you address it that way. The um, taxation and theft just becomes like a mantra that that's hollow for a lot of people, as opposed to a springboard or a gateway into the next discussion of how we then start to fund those things. Um, right. Looking at the reality of private police forces, they don't just subsist on tickets and how they're actually paid, and and that's um, <clears throat> I think that that's a that's a great, uh, obviously, uh, you, you with the hat probably are used to those conversations more than anybody uh, Absolutely. on answering how taxation is theft and what you do from there. So uh, the debt or, uh, just hit $22 trillion. Uh, How do we tackle yeah. that problem? So that, a lot of it, it's, you know, it's not my debt. Um, I didn't ask for the money. I didn't borrow the money. I didn't receive the money. I didn't sign for it. It wasn't deposited into my account. I didn't spend it. It's not my debt and I'm not going to pay for it. And neither should you. None of us should. Um, the, the reality is a lot of politicians borrowed this money in our name, knowing that, you know, they're never going to have to pay it back. And it's completely irresponsible. And the way it works now is they're just going to continue to borrow and borrow and borrow. And the banks are happy to do it because, you know, the, they, they, they won't lend to any other business this way, but they'll lend to the government because they know ultimately the government 
is never going to lose their customers. All they have to do is point a gun at people and say, pay the tax and people are going to pay the tax no matter what. Um, so we just need to default on the debt. It's the smartest possible thing to do. Um, and one of the, one of the biggest holders of all of this debt, because a lot of people worry, well, what does that, what does that mean? we we owe money to China. Um, I know you asked, you, you pointed that out yesterday. Yeah. Um, there's the federal reserve is a big one. Now the federal reserve, no one should have any sympathy for them. They basically came from nothing. They didn't lend anything valuable to the government. In fact, their whole operation is, you know, um, supposedly they're lending us the money that says federal reserve note on it. But the reality is those are printed at the U S treasury, the, the U S mint. Um, and so the U S government owns the printing presses. They buy the ink, they buy the paper, they pay for the labor, they pay for the machines. Um, the operational cost, the electricity, the building, everything. And somehow this is called borrowing. And I know there's this, this big game of three card Monty where they print treasury notes and then supposedly they give those to the Fed and the Fed uses those to back the notes that the United States government is printing. Um, yeah. But still, it's, it's just a shenanigan. It's, there's no actual value that they're lending to us. So the, <clears throat> the, the debt is troublesome, I think, especially because we say, well, what will what'll China do if we're just like, hey, we're not paying those back anymore. That's too bad. Uh, I know that there is, and, and you, you brought this up, that with a business, when you get a bond from a business to say, I just need a little bit more, you accept that risk that you might not get anything right. back on it. Or maybe you'll get double back on it. The government promises, I think, what's a bond these days? You get your promise double back within 10 years of buying the bond, something like that. I have, I have even, even looked at the market on that lately. Yeah, something like that. But, you know, that's what you do. I know, like, because here, I mean, when I think of bonds, just from where I grew up, I think of my grandma buying one for me. Right when I'm a little kid and then I can sell them when I go to college, you know, and they're, they'll be worth, you know, they, they were guaranteed. The rate was guaranteed. It was always six times, whatever, regardless of how our economy did versus a bond in the free market, which is you put the money for it and you say, maybe I'll lose it. Maybe I'll get a ton back, but that depends on how well they do. This is just saying, well, you'll get six times your value back in right. you know, 20 years, but I don't know if we'll be in six times better situation. We're just kind of hoping we're going to borrow against our children is really what it is. So, I mean, is this just straight up bad news for grandmas that have these bonds? Like, should they be cashing them now? If it's, you're about to be elected <laughs> is what I'm asking. It's well, here's the reality. Um, you know, you, you make an investment in a bad business and that business goes bankrupt, then, you know, the bonds are worthless. Yeah. And you know, the, What's, what's really difficult and, and problematic is that, you know, if you were to, I, I could have the surest bet, right? I could be sitting literally on a gold mine and I could say, hey, I'm going to sell you bonds for my business. You're going to help me buy machines to pull like literally bricks of gold out of the ground. And it's guaranteed we're going to make billions, hundreds of billions of dollars. And I'm going to be able to pay back your bonds. According to the U.S. government's federal laws and, and everything else, I have to make you sign, before you give me this money, you have to sign a stack of disclosures basically saying you understand that you're willing to lose everything and my business is probably going to fail and you're going you're gonna to be out in the dirt. Right. Um, and, but, and, and this is like on a sure thing. Now with the government, which is completely not a sure thing because they have no economic activity, they don't produce anything of value, they don't really provide a valuable service in any way um, that, you know, that, that, they, that they charge for voluntarily. Um, this, this operation is allowed to go on and they're allowed to sell you treasury notes and just pay cash. And there's no disclaimer. There's no warning. There's no sec regulations or anything. Um, they basically just guarantee that these bonds are good for life, no matter what. And like you said, you know, the, the interest is guaranteed. Um, who does that? Nobody except for the government. And ultimately they know, well, push comes to shove. We can just print it. Yeah. So, you know, the reality is, if, if you invest in treasury notes and that's all you're holding on to, you know, you're putting all your eggs in one basket. And it's, it's not to say that, you know, if I become president, you're going you're gonna to lose all your value in these assets. But the reality is, you know, um, you've kind of already been scammed by buying these things. You should stop buying them now. And, you know, if, if someone else is elected president and they don't default on the debt, so you get to say, oh, I'm going to cash these out. Well, they're just kicking the can down the road. Ultimately, more money will be borrowed. The debt's going to continue to go up. And eventually some president's going to come along who doesn't want to default on the debt and they're going to have to default on the debt. And, and when they do that, the debt's going to be so high, it's going to cause a lot more problems. So this is something we need to do sooner rather than later. 
Yep. Totally agreed there. Um, problem three, you said indiv- the lack of individual freedom. How do we get more of that, especially it's hard to see it coming from a federal branch or from the executive right. branch. How does, it, how does President Daniel Berman help me in my life get more personal freedoms? So what we need to do is there are a lot of, um, I call them duplicate agencies where they, they duplicate efforts. So like with the federal government, we have the Department of Education that basically duplicates the effort of the states, which are, they're already providing education. And the federal government comes in and basically they take a ton of money from all the states and then they give a little bit back. And, um, and they provide no real value to education. If anything, they make it worse because they're trying to standardize it between states who have different wants and needs. Nobody's getting what they want because they're trying to create this one homogenous education system that's, that is going to be good for everyone. And that's just not possible because everyone wants different things. So, so that's one example. Um, there's the DEA who's basically saying what, what drugs can be legal and can't be legal. Um, and not that any government should have the right to tell you what you can or can't put in your body, but definitely not the federal government. At least let's give that back to the states and then let's start fighting for the states to, to give us our freedoms back there. Um, but at the federal level, there are a lot of agencies that are basically, um, you know, and and they'll come up with all kinds of excuses, interstate commerce and, and all this other stuff, um, to say, yeah, we're, we're just regulating commerce. And it's like, no, you're limiting people's freedom. You're telling them they can't have certain things. Um, and that's not your job. The federal government holds so many strings over the states, it's hard to see what a state would actually do on their own. It really is. Uh, uh, Astute point. Let's move on. Let's say, okay, I really want to make sure Daniel Berman becomes president. All right. That sounds great to me. What we have to do then is you're going to have to appeal to more than just libertarians. If every single libertarian votes, you might get 16% at best every single one. So we're going to have to pull from other groups. So I'm going to ask you about these other groups and just tell me what your appeal is to them. So let's, let's start with social liberals. I am a Democrat. I am concerned about the growing disparity in our communities between um, minorities and whites. I am concerned about LGBTQ issues. I see the, the wage gap in the workplace. What do you, what would your presidency offer that would make me change my vote from a Democrat to you, a libertarian? Sure. So um, there are a lot of things to look at here. Um, you know, when we talk about um, racial or gender inequalities, um, there's, you know, there, there's a lot of different aspects to look at. So um, first, let's talk about police misconduct. Um, several years ago, I started an organization called Accountable Authority, and I published the Accountable Authority Act, which was a proposed bill um, that would basically um, give us the tools to fight back against police misconduct, because obviously the whole investigating themselves thing doesn't work. Um, and so, so what? This, yeah. <laughs> um, so this gives us the tools to, to say, hey, you know, let's let's get a legal team together privately, and that legal team would have certain rights to subpoena um, uh, government records, subpoena police officers, and indict police officers when a district attorney won't. Um, that can really help us with with some of these, you know, uh, 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 police um, issues where the police are are you know enforcing racial inequality. Um, uh, because, you know, right now it's easy for them to do it because they don't have any fear of, of consequences for, for their actions. Yeah. Um, when it comes to a lot of things like, you know, the, the gender pay gap, um, things like this, what I really like to do is say, look, I, I understand that there's a problem with this. Um, and I understand, I mean, you know, both sides are right. On one, on one hand, sometimes it's blown out of proportion. On the other hand, it's not like it doesn't exist. Um, you know, there, there, all, there are all kinds of inequalities, you know, whether it's someone doesn't want to hire some person because of their race. Um, and really what we don't want to do is, you know, this is in a way it's a use of force, right? It's, it's saying like, Hey, I'm going to use force against you and prevent you from having these opportunities because I don't like the way that you look. Um, and the, the flip side of that is to say, Oh, well, we're going to, we're going to have government come along and put a gun to someone's head and say, no, you have to hire this person. And that creates all kinds of problems because now it's like, okay, what if someone truly isn't qualified for something? And yeah. it, it creates all kinds of extra problems. And so what my advice would be is to stop focusing on the problem and, and start focusing on 
overcoming these problems. Uh, a lot of people have, have really been able to overcome these problems. Um, you know, you look at, you look at, um, you know, anybody who's successful, who's, who's a woman, who's, um, who's uh, African American, Oprah, for example, um, you know, some people have been able to do amazing things. And then there's also, I was looking up, um, I went to a women's march um, and I was, I was uh, promoting some information there. And I looked up, you know, who are the top um, female CEOs? And they're the, the CEOs who run like IBM, um, uh, General Motors, Oracle, you know, some really, really massive companies that, that employ millions of people are run by women. So even though, yes, there's sometimes there's a, there's a gender pay gap, that doesn't mean that should be holding you back. You can go ahead and you can be successful in spite of all of these things. And so that's what I would really push for. And once that starts happening, I mean, once you prove that you're successful, people are going to want to hire you and pay you more no matter what. And that's when you start getting into the, the competitive marketing of, of your skills. Um, and, and we should all focus on doing that because, you know, the reality is there are always going to be people who have stupid reasons to, to not like you. And it might just be like, oh, you know, it's a East Coast, West Coast thing, or it's a, it's a California, Texas thing. It's no longer a skin color, but it's, it's, you know, you went for the Patriots and I went for the, you know, for the, uh, Rams. For the Packers, the, yeah. Okay. There you go. So, <laughs> it, you know, it can be, it, it becomes all these different things. And like, so what if it's not race, we're still going to have these problems. And if we still have this victim mentality, that's, that's holding us back instead of saying, no, we can be successful in spite of all these things, then, um, you know, that's always going to be a problem. Instead, we should focus on moving forward and, and overcoming. Okay. Let's talk about the other side of the social ladder, the conservatives. I'm concerned about, I hate it when my church isn't allowed to, we're threatened to say, oh, you're going to get sanctioned if you don't condone this type of marriage. Or they say, you can't have that cross by the side of the road. Uh, immigration's a concern for me. I'm just very... I'm very concerned that socially the conservative side is under attack. Why would I support you instead of Donald Trump, who seems to be doing okay on these issues? Sure. So um, when it comes to churches and their, their um, you know, a, a church is a private organization and they have the right to set their own rules and do whatever they want um, as long as, you know, they're not harming anybody or taking their stuff. Um, so when it comes to what types of marriages they want to do, that's fine. If they, if they don't want to do, um, you know, uh, same sex marriages in their church, that's fine. And if, and you know, we see, we see the same thing with, you know, there's the, there's the cake, um, the, the bakery story. Yes. It's really the same thing. It's, you know, this is private property and we, we have to respect that. And, you know, I understand it might be offensive that somebody doesn't want to do something for you. If, if you want a same sex marriage and somebody doesn't want to bake a cake and some church doesn't want to marry you, I understand that's offensive, but the reality is that's their private property. But at the same time, like I said, you know, focusing on moving forward and overcoming the challenges, start a gay church, start a gay bakery. Um, you know, and if you, if you really want to shove it in their face, then, then don't accept, um, straight couples into your church. I think that's, um, counterproductive um, because really you should say, no, we're going to, we're going to show you how it can be done. We're going to show you that we can be accepting of all people. And, you know, instead of being um, uh, kind of reactive and negative, you can just be positive and, and, you know, maybe everyone's going to come to your church and, and your bakery now because you are more open to everybody and the other guys are going to go out of business. Um, you know, that's, that's always a possibility, but we can't, we, you know, the, the minute we start saying you have to cater to somebody um, and their, their wants, um, you know, we're losing, we're losing private property rights. And even if what they're doing is offensive, they're not actually harming anybody, then, then, you know, there, there shouldn't be any real problem there. Um, now when it comes to the, the border issues, um, these are, this is really an interesting subject. Um, but you know, I've been, um, spending most of my time for the last couple of years in Mexico, um, most of the people here don't want to go to the U S I know a couple of people who did go to the U S they didn't like it and they came back. Um, there's, you know, all these fears that we have about all these gangs and cartels coming over the border. For one thing, if, any, if that does exist, it's from the drug war, which we want to end. Um, but also, you know, we have all these problems that are created by, um, stopping the free flow of people from, from either side. And really what's happening is, you know, politicians, they get elected, they get power and they get money. And then they get money to sell their power, right? They sell their votes for, to special interests and they start making more and more money. 
Well, mm-hmm. if they want to, if they don't want to, you know, leave this job and go back to the private sector where they actually have to work for a living, they're going to do whatever they can to make themselves um, relevant and, and important so that people are afraid to let them leave, right? So what they do is they start creating problems. All the issues that, that we've heard about, um, gangs and cartels and all these other things, they've either been created by strong border policy or they don't exist at all. And we really have to realize that. Like, you know, people are worried about like, oh, they're going to come here and take our taxes. Um, they're they're going to put their kids in our schools and, and we have to pay for that. Well, if they're here going to school, they're renting an apartment somewhere or maybe buying a house, they're paying property tax. And that property tax in most places is what pays for the schools. Cool. Yeah. So it's, you know, if anything, they're helping to subsidize that. They're helping to subsidize um, social security and the income tax because they're actually paying more. I think it's like a, a billion dollars a year which isn't a whole lot in the grand scheme of things, but they're paying a billion dollars more into those systems than they're taking out. And the reason for that, of course, is that, you know, they're working with fake IDs and they can't get a tax return. They can't get social security benefits because they don't have an ID in the name that they're working under. Um, So really these are a lot of false fears that politicians are giving us. And, you know, it's, it's so they can stay in power and we need to stop, we need to like recognize it for what it is and stop acting reactively and, and, you know, stop giving into their propaganda. Yeah. All right. Let's move to the economic side of things. Uh, this is this is probably more of your wheelhouse. But uh, let's say I'm a let's say I'm a liberal uh, economically. I just I just feel like the I'm sick of the riches getting tax breaks and everybody saying we need to cut down on welfare, and I am worried about the state of the poor, and I don't like seeing the these fat cats get payouts to run a company poorly so what do you offer them that a democratic presidential candidate wouldn't be able to offer well first of all i would completely agree with them on on certain things like um bailouts and subsidies we need to end those um the when we talk about welfare there's two kinds there's the social welfare and the corporate welfare corporate welfare is the first one to go um because we're you know we're giving money to corporations now i understand a lot of what's called corporate welfare is just tax breaks. And that's kind of a different story. Um, but yeah, for the most part, what we're going to be doing is, is, you know, we're going to stop these subsidies. It's going to save some money. Um, when it comes to, um, you know, the, the social, um, side of that, you know, we talk about, you know, well, government's going to be giving money out to, to help the homeless and, and, you know, all these other things. It's really, you know, if you really look at what's going on, why does the government even need to do that? And, it's, it's really like, you know, the, the government is really great at breaking your legs and selling you crutches and then taxing the crutches and regulating how you can use them <laughs> and then pointing a gun in your face and making you thank them. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, when you look at, when you look at, you know, why are people poor? Why are people homeless? A lot of it has to do with, you know, the cost of living. Why is the cost of living high? Because of property tax. Why, why do people have less disposable income? Because they're, it's taken out of their paychecks. Um, there are so many reasons that, that, you know, there are so many ways that we can, we can put more money in people's pockets so that they, they, they don't hit these situations. Um, now, of course, in some cases, it's unavoidable. Some people are, are mentally ill or they, they, they have um, a health issue and they become unemployable. There's so many different things that can happen. Um, and the reality is there are plenty of organizations who are out there trying to help out of the goodness of their own heart. There are people out there who are giving food away they're, they're creating shelters for people to sleep. And the government is actively going around. They're taking the tax money that they stole from everybody else. And they're using this money to hire thugs to go around and slash tents that homeless people are sleeping in in, in the middle of winter. They're fining um, churches who are letting homeless people sleep there. They're destroying the food that, that um, people are giving away for free in parks to the homeless. Um, they're, you know, they, and then they say, oh yeah, but you have to thank us because we're giving you food stamps and we're, we're giving you subsidized housing and all this other stuff. Um, and you know, so we really need to look at it like, okay, let's look at the big picture. The government is causing more harm than good. And you know, if we start, if we start, uh, easing up on people so that they're able to live more freely within their, within their own means, we're going to see that, that poverty is going to start going down and a lot of these problems are going to start disappearing on their own. And the people who, you know, who still struggle and have problems, there will be people to take care of them. Even, uh, this is just from our other podcasts. I mean, we have government officials admitting that if we were to, they were to take that same money and put it into a competitive atmosphere, that 
that they do a better job taking care of the Absolutely. the poor, the needy, the the you know food stamps. I, I mean, it's and just here was it a, it, there was an interesting um, experiment that was done. So you know, everybody's like, yeah, let's let's drug test everybody who's on welfare. Um, and th this has been tried in several states, and it usually ends up costing a lot of money, and nobody fails the drug test. Yeah. But what Vermont, I think it was, it was either Vermont or New Hampshire, um, did an experiment where they said, okay, forget about drug testing. If you are able-bodied um, and you're on welfare, do community service. So we're giving you money anyway every, every week or every month. Um, just go out and you know, clean the highways, do, do a little bit of work in exchange for the money. Otherwise, you're just sitting around at home playing video games and you know, it doesn't make much sense for us to give you this if you're not really even trying. Uh -huh. And so what happened was 80% of the recipients of that welfare almost immediately got off of those programs and went and got real jobs because they realized, hey, I'm going to be making more per hour if I go and get a real job. So, you know, I, I don't want to say that people aren't trying, but it's, it's, um, it's easy to fall into that trap. Anyone would do it. You know, it's, it's easy to not move out of your parents' house when, you're, when your parents aren't telling you, when, when they're not pushing you out. Sure. Um, it's, you know, it's, uh, when there's an easy way out, people don't usually put in two work. And it's, it's not something to blame somebody for. It's human nature. Um, sure. But we should recognize that and we should stop, you know, feeding the bears and, and making it easy for people to, to not apply themselves. Yeah. Ben Franklin uh, was very good about charitable services, established a ton of them. And I think he has a quote that says, the best way to get rid of the poor people is not to make them comfortable in the situation, but to drive them from their poverty. And that's coming Absolutely. from a guy who established a lot of our first charitable systems. Uh, so let's, let's move on to the, to the fourth ladder here. And this is the economic conservatives. I'm concerned about the size of government. I am sad that it's always growing. I see every department getting bigger. I, really only care about the Department of Defense and everything else just keeps expanding and expanding. When, when, how, should I, are you the solution to shrink that government or should I be waiting on other Republicans to do it? Absolutely. I mean, taxation is theft says it all. <laughs> um, you know, we're, we're going to cut taxes. We're going to cut a lot of these duplicate programs. Um, you know, we, we saw during the shutdown, when you know all these agencies were shut down and not doing anything that it had almost no impact on our lives and you know probably the biggest person who's going to complain about this is is the federal employee and i just want to say to them you know don't worry about it because the reality is there are going to be so many jobs created because government's not in the way stopping businesses from starting up um you know even though you're not going to be working for the federal government these jobs are going to reappear there's going to be plenty of other jobs that's that's just, I mean, it's a, it's a guarantee. That's how the economy is going to work. Um, but absolutely, I'm all for cutting down a lot of agencies, cutting down a lot of the expense, and even slimming down the military. You know, bring them home. If you, you know, if if all we can do is is bring them home from the foreign nations so that they're defending our country from I don't know who's really trying to attack us at this point, um, except for maybe the people that we've been <laughs> drone bombing for Ooh. for so many years. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's you know the people who are pissed off at our foreign policy and what we've been doing to them. Um, you know, there's the, you, we're not, you know, Mexico's not building an army to try and invade us. Canada's not, China's not, um, it's, you know, it's, there's, there's not a huge reason for us to have a, as big of a military as we have. We're like, we spend three times as much as, uh, I think it's China and Russia combined, which is insane. Uh, we, we don't need to do that. Yeah. Um, okay. You've, let's say you've satisfied those, you can bring other people in. Let's get you through this primary process. You're going to have to appeal to a lot of different kinds of libertarians. So let's kind of put those into groups and talk about why you're the best candidate for them. So let's look at uh, the libertarian left, the libertarian socialist, the mutualists, Mike Shipley, Makino, Sam Coppinger, whoever you can think of. Um, why, what do you bring to the table that would make them more comfortable with, with you? Sure. So um, uh, I've talked to plenty of these people, the, the libertarian socialists, um, and, you know, it's, it's, we've had discussions. They're very anti-government. Um, so, you know, they don't want government agencies telling us how to live our lives. 
Um, there is a concern that they're socialists. So for some reason they want to, or for, in, they want to find some way to steal from us to pay for their social programs. Um, I've talked to a lot of them and that's not really the case. The, the, the biggest um, concern that people might have with them is property rights. And for the most part, a lot of these guys are, you know, adverse possession. If, if you're, if your house looks abandoned, um, and you're not using it, well, Hey, it's just abandoned property. And it really makes sense that way. Um, you know, if, if you've abandoned a property for 20 years and you don't do anything with it, just because you have a piece of paper, like it doesn't make any sense. There's, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, I've seen these programs where it's like, oh, the government has a list of, of uh, property that, you know, you just have to search the database and you'll find out that you have property from, you know, a thousand years ago. And it's like, what, what sense does this make? Um, when somebody else might have said, oh, well, nobody's here. Nobody's using this property. I'm going to take it for myself. And if somebody comes back around and says, hey, you're on my property, then okay, fine. I'll get up and go. Um, so I, I think that's the biggest concern that most libertarians have with the left. And, you know, I've talked to a lot of them and and we agree on most points. The government should really not um, be in charge of, you know, a lot of this stuff. Um, so, so I think we're, we're good there. All right. Let's uh, go to the right. Most of these are capitalists. Uh, you got the Mises Caucus. You got the Joshua Smiths, Michael Heises, Tom Woods, Eric Julies over on that side. W what do you offer to the libertarian right that would make them excited about your candidacy? Right. I think the, uh, the uh, taxation is theft and, um, you know, getting rid of a lot of government regulations so that people are able to create businesses, new businesses, um, you know, new ideas that, you know, uh, you know, what's interesting is when you come up with a really new idea that's never been done before, which government agency do you go to to get a, a permit for it? <laughs> um, it's, you know, there was... Yeah, it's insane. And there was, there was, I don't know if you know the Randall Lord story. Um, he's basically in prison for a law that doesn't exist. Um, he was, he was selling Bitcoin um, to his friends for cash. And uh, the, the feds came along and said, well, hey, you need a, you need a, uh, you need to be filed as a money transmitter. And then um, his attorney who didn't know the laws that well, because nobody knew the laws that well on Bitcoin, convinced him to plead guilty. Um, so now he's got a guilty plea. And then he calls the Louisiana department uh, that manages the, the MSB, the money service business stuff and says, yeah, do I need a license for this? And they said, no, you don't need a license for that. And so he goes back to the court and says, I'd like to change my plea. And then the court says, oh, well, that would be an inconvenience to the court. You're still guilty. We're going to hold it. You're going to spend 30 months or, or something like that um, in prison wow. um, for a law that doesn't exist. So yeah, you know, there, there's definitely a lot that I, I can sympathize, sympathize with um, with the ANCAPs that, you know, we're going to get a lot of regulations out of the way. We're going to see new businesses um, be created in, in all kinds of different ways, and they're going to be taxed a whole lot less. Yeah. Let's look at the, uh, the anarchists now that they're uh, probably the most stingy bunch. They usually have a problem <laughs> with anybody just because they're running for president. Um, but what would you offer to the libertarians the anarchists within the libertarian party that would say, okay, I believe that this guy is, at least gets us on the path to getting rid of government. Right. So um, I've had a lot of really interesting conversations with anarchists, um, you know, whether or not it's okay to vote. Um, some will say government is by definition the use of force. And, you know, we, we really get into these really semantic arguments. Um, we'll say, you know, I'll, I'll ask, okay, so let's say you have government and we can just wave a magic wand and all of a sudden um, they're not violating anybody's rights. They're not stealing from anybody. They're not pointing a gun at anybody's head. Um, would you be happy with that type of government? And the answer I usually get from them is, but that's not government. So now we're arguing over, okay, what do we call this other thing? Sure. Um, and, if, and if you don't call it government, then the statists are going to be like, but we need government. But it's like, if the statists are happy to have a government that doesn't violate rights, and then the anarchists are sitting over there like, but it's not government. Stop calling it government. It's like, why? Like, they have what they want. They have government. It's not violating, violating your rights. You have what you want. Why fight over it past that? Um, and then there's, then there's the idea of voting or not voting. And, and reality, the act of voting itself is not an act of violence. You can have, you know, you can be playing a game. You can, you know, me and you can say, hey, um, let's get 10 people together and we're gonna play a game and we're gonna have a voting system within this game. Voting itself is not an act of violence. It's when you vote for something that you're giving power to that's then gonna use that as an excuse to commit violence against somebody. Um, 
And so, you know, I hear a lot from, from anarchists, okay, well, voting doesn't matter because the whole system's rigged. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's, it's all about who counts the votes and the, the voting, the electronic systems are rigged. Um, and it's, it's completely useless. And I hear a lot of these arguments too. And, you know, the reality is maybe, um, you know, they're, they're not wrong about a lot of that, but at the same time, it's like, look, if you're, if you're the people who are in power and you're looking at the election results and it's like, okay, we have to come up with more fake Democrat and Republican votes because there are so many of these libertarian votes coming through. Um, it's really like it's it's a wake up call to them that scares them because they start realizing that there are a lot of people out there who are not happy with what's going on. And it is a protest vote. It's a middle finger to the system. And so, you know, at the very least on voting day, get out there and give them the finger. I, I mean, a couple anecdotes from that. Uh, I think my biggest claim to fame to date is my date, my debate with Larkin Rose about voting. And I did another debate about the role of government. And at the end of both of them, he basically said, well, you're an anarchist. You just are choosing not to call yourself an anarchist because <laughs> you're in this nonviolent mutual form of government, which I don't call government. And so I am like, okay, it was a semantic battle. So I completely relate to everything right. you're talking about there. It just turns into these little stipulations. So I think, uh, I think you Ironically, and I are definitely one mind. Um, going back to the, to the libertarian socialists, after talking to a few of them, um, I wouldn't even call them socialists. Like we've had that that argument before too, where it's yeah. like you're not you're you're basically an an anarchist uh, humanitarian. Like you're talking about using your own effort and your own resources to help um, you know uh, help cure starvation in the world, um, and you're not trying to steal it from anybody. That's not necessarily socialism. Is is kind of like humanitarianism. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, George Orwell was a socialist, and he's, it's funny because he's probably the most famous voice against socialism ever, but he, was, yeah. he believed in a voluntary form of it and was very scared by the authoritarian form of it. And right. that little distinction is very important to make. That's um, big. <laughs> uh, so let's, let's talk about the moderates now. Now, generally, these are the guys who usually end up showing up to the convention who actually end up pushing the candidate forward. They want the suit and tie. They want... I hate to say it, but they want the boredom. They want the steady, the steady message. They want the Gary Johnson, the Bill. They would have given us Bill Weld. They were okay with Bob Barr. You know, usually like ex-Republican-ish guys who have had moderate success. And the, how, how do you appeal to to them, the moderates, the minarchists? Right. So um, I think I mean there's there's a couple different um, things I like to say to them. Um, uh, so it's, that's, that's kind of a difficult question because I don't want to take up too much time on this answer. But, um, you know, a lot of them, you know, they'll tell me, oh, the hat, it's too much. It says taxation is theft and they're afraid of that. Um, I'll just give you a quick story about, uh, um, you know, something that happened on YouTube. Um, there was a, a video of a guy who gets stopped in a Lamborghini. He's, he's from Canada. He's driving with a Canadian driver's license. And the cops lying to him about what the law is. Oh, you're not allowed to use the Canadian license here. So I started, you know, putting my two cents in in the comments and somebody saw my name on, on YouTube is taxation is theft. And they said, you know, something rude like, oh, why don't you just yell taxation is theft at them and make all your problems go away. <laughs> and, you know, so, so this, is, this is where people will say, see, taxation is theft is offensive to people and it scares people away when, when that person we could have captured and, and turned into a libertarian. Um, the reality is um, you, it's how you respond to that. So you can, I could have easily gone back to him and said, you know what, you're an asshole and, and you know, screw you. And, you know, I could have gotten a fight with him. Instead, I said, you know what? Uh, oh, because uh, in his original comment, he said, yeah, what about first responders, police, um, you know, courts, all, all this other stuff. Um, so instead, what I did is I responded to him and I said, hey, you know what? All those things are actually really great things, but why don't we use our brains and figure out a way to pay for these things without sticking a gun in someone's face and, and robbing them? And so, you know, he came up with another response. Oh, well, why don't you tell me, mister, how are we going to pay for the roads? <laughs> um, and, uh, and so my response to that was, well, why don't you follow my YouTube channel? Because that's all I talk about. I can't fit it in a little paragraph here. Um, and, and within a few hours, I saw that he subscribed to my YouTube channel. So, you know, it's, it's you know, this does like strike up a little bit of a controversy. Um, but the reality is like you can take, you don't have to react to it and like turn it into something negative. You can actually turn it into something positive, um, which is, you know, that's, that's what I've been working really hard to do over the past couple of years is figure out how to do that. 
Um, and, you know, for the moderates who really want to grow the party in size and they want to, you know, they want to get the message across to the right people, this is how we do it. You know, it's, it's at first, it's a little bit shocking, but if you know how to follow up with it, um, then you can really get good results out of it. Great. Um, so this might be the most important. Why are you better than any of the other libertarian candidates who've, uh, who applies for? Why should, why you instead of, uh, uh instead of your, your, the pool, I guess. It's, it's mostly the hat. The hat is just awesome. It uh, is. I <laughs> guess that's simple. Um, it's yeah, no, I've, you know, we have, um, it, it's still really early, so we don't know who all the candidates are going to be. Um, but you know, from, from the candidates who are out there, um, you know, we've got John McAfee, who's, uh, he's got a little bit of political trouble right now. Cause he's, he's sitting on a boat in international waters. Last I heard, um, I don't know if he's going to be able to attend debates or conventions or anything. Um, but I actually supported him in 2016 because he was a, a very strong, um, libertarian. Um, some of the other guys, uh, Ben Letter and Arvind Bora, they've got some really great things to say, but realistically, um, you know, I don't think they're, they're, they've got it down in getting the message out to everybody who the message needs to go to. They're not going to be able to pull in those Republican and Democrat votes. Okay. Um, and, and I think that's really, really, really important. Um, and then there's, uh, uh, Adam Kokesh is, you know, he's, he's really good at what he does, but I, you know, he's still, I don't think he's going to be able to reach the left as far left and right as he needs to in order to win. And I think, you know, he's, he's another one of those guys that has, you know, I don't like to gossip, but he's, he's got some, uh, some, uh, let's just say political hurdles that, that he's going to have. I have heard um, some things about Adam. Yeah. Kokesh. Yes. Um, and then, yeah. Um, and then finally there's, um, uh, Vermin Supreme who, you know, he's actually, I, I really like what he does. I know a lot of people just absolutely hate him. Cause like, no, he can't win. Well, the reality is he's not going to win because he is kind of a joker. Um, and you know, he, he does have a pretty awesome hat, but um, you know, the, the, the reality is I do find a lot of value in the conversations that he brings. So for example, you know, he goes around saying free ponies. Um, when, you know, we're, we're actually, we're going to have a debate on that later. Um, but what's interesting is I've had debates with lots of his followers online who are all about the free ponies. And, you know, we're, what we're able to do is we're able to use the same arguments for and against socialism. Um, which normally we would do, we, you know, you'd have an argument with somebody on socialism about free healthcare, free education, and they start bringing in the emotional factor to it. And they're like, you're trying to take away my head. You don't want me to be educated. You don't want me to be healthy. Um, but when you're talking about free ponies, because it is kind of a joke, you actually do get an actual conversation going on about it without the emotional factor. And I think that is, that is really important for people to do. Um, you know, because otherwise we're just, we're just, you know, oversensitized to, to, um, uh, emotional type arguments. So maybe a good vice presidential choice for you. <laughs> you know, the, cr the crazy hat party is what the liberty. I, I definitely have him in the cabinet. All right. Fant <laughs> fantastic. Um, all right. So nuts and bolts, 90% of running for president, uh, having worked on campaigns is fundraising and donating your time to talk to people. Uh, do you have a plan in place to raise the money that you need to make a run for it, to get the support that you need from all over the country to make a legitimate run for president? Absolutely. So um, I've got a communications director right now who's doing some pretty amazing things. Um, I, I can't say too much about, of, about it. Um, so there's going to be some good surprises coming up, but what we are trying to do is raise $1 million before, um, before the uh, convention in Austin, which is, you know, pretty good for, for libertarian candidates, especially before, um, before the uh, convention. Um, and what we're going to do with that is really just, you know, a lot of it's going to be spent on getting the message out there because that's obviously what's really important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what I, what I hope to be able to do is get to the convention in 2020 and say, look, this is the money we've raised and this is how many people we've been able to reach with the message and look at what we've been able to do um, in terms of getting support from voters. Um, and, you know, once, once I'm able to show that, hopefully it'll be a no brainer to say, yes, this is the guy we need to continue, even though he's got a big goofy yellow hat. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, very last question. Um, let's say you've got me hooked. I want to be a part of the campaign or I just want to learn more about you. Uh, where do you direct people to learn more about you or get involved with your campaign? 
Sure. So my main campaign site uh, that's got my platform and everything on there is Berman2020.com. That's B-E-H-R-M-A-N 2020.com. Uh, there's also legalizedpineapplepizza.org. I'll let you check that one out. That's a, that's a pretty fun one. Um, you can register to be a volunteer on, um, on Berman2020.com. You can contact me on either one. And I'm actually very accessible. So, you know, I get people messaging me all the time from everywhere. They just want to have a conversation. Um, I actually, uh, uh, I guess this is a little off topic. I just got back from Uganda. I was speaking there um, about taxation. And I have a lot of students from all over Africa now who are messaging me, asking me to explain taxation and theft to them. And, and they're really interested in it. So, you know, I'm very, I'm very easy to access. So if you have any questions, um, you know, you can also get me on Facebook. Uh, there's facebook.com slash taxation is theft number two, because the first one was taken. Uh, even though there's, they got shut down in the last Facebook purge, unfortunately, but they, they kind of turned into a conspiracy page after a while. So uh, no, 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 ma no major loss. Um, <laughs> and then taxation is theft cards. You can go and get your swag. I've got some, I've got some cool hats, everything from beach towels and umbrellas to coffee mugs and t-shirts and all kinds of cool stuff. Awesome. Well, I tell you what, I want to put all those links in the show notes. If you're listening Daniel, thank you so much for doing this interview again. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Do donating so much of your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, be, being the first, I know that, that the first is always the hardest because then everybody listens to you and say, okay, this is, this is what I'm going to say for this. <laughs> this is what's wrong with what he said. Right. <laughs> I appreciate you taking the lead off spot because somebody's got to do it and actually uh, seeking me out to do it. So again, thank you so much for making the time. Uh, if you're one of our listeners and you want to get in touch with Daniel, he's told you how. Uh, thank you so much for, for being a listener and We're Libertarians. We appreciate all of your interest, especially that we've had for the presidential candidate series. So we're happy to bring it to you. Uh, please rate this episode well. Tell us what you think of Daniel in the comments, whether it be Facebook or YouTube or our own website, We're Libertarians.com. They'll be on all of it. Thank you to our Patre Patreon donors who... Uh, frankly, give us the finances to make this whole podcast possible. So again, thank you, Daniel. You enjoy the rest of your day. All right.